Back in the early years when we first started this wagon business, one of the first books we added to our library was a book called The Carey's Terminology, a historical dictionary written by Don Berkebile. This book was produced by the Smithsonian. In this book, Don Berkebile states that the Sarvan hub was patented first in 1857 by James D. Sarvan, and hence the name. And this is the hub that we're going to look a little closer to, how it's designed as I rebuild it in today's video. And along with the hubs, he also sent the tires up. So we're going to get all these things kind of tore apart and just see what we have to work with. Now this style of hub has become probably the most widely used style of hub, especially used here in America. It has a cast flange on each side of the spokes with a wood core in the middle and it's a very strong hub. It has eight rivets going through every other spoke at the joint and this overall is a very very strong hub and a very popular widely used hub. Now one thing I noticed right off that this hub was severely damaged. It was full of horseshoe nails, but inside the boxing was broke into three separate pieces. So not only was the core bad, but we got to do something about a boxing, and that's what makes this wheel run on the axle. And one of the odd things about this broken boxing is when I finally got all three pieces apart, the three pieces didn't even fit to each other. You know how something breaks, you can usually put the puzzle back together? Well, these were just three separate pieces. They didn't fit at all. So it kind of made me wonder if this wasn't put in the hub, broken, and then shimmed to stay in place with all these horseshoe nails. Who knows? Well, when you're in the business of restorations, and if you're a pack rat like me, one thing you seldom do is throw old parts away. So you might maybe have noticed on top of my bolt bin this assortment of old boxings of different styles. And it's times like this that I take the opportunity to go through and see if I can find something close. It'd be ideal if I could find the exact length and taper but that's kind of a needle in a haystack. But oftentimes, if I can find something close that's maybe a little long or maybe even just a little smaller in diameter, I can put it on a lathe and adjust the taper to make it fit. And I have two here that just might work. Now these boxings that press in the hub that actually runs on the spindle of the axle don't have to be highly accurate. Usually if they're within about ten thousandths, that's enough to leave a nice room for grease. That's close enough. But all the rust on here, I'm going to run them through the sandblaster. Now I can get a little closer guess on just what I have. So I don't actually have to take the caliper and get exact thousandths on here. I'm just going to take these little feeler gauges or what's called a comparator and just see how close we are. Hopefully we're just a little under, then we can make them fit when I open them up. Now the boxing in the upper right is the original that was in the good hub. So I'm going to use that as my pattern as it ends up being the one that is on the upper left is really close in the bell. It's a little narrow, a little small through the body of it, but I can work with that. 
the one that's in the center actually has a bell it's a little large so I'm going to end up kicking that one out and these two top ones are the ones I'm going to work with And when I get old flanges in like this on Sarvin hubs, it's real common that they've been kind of distorted. You can see dimples where each rivet hole is. Well, as these wheels have aged, this is real common, they start to loosen up. So, to tighten them up, they're oftentimes put on an anvil and just tightened a little more. Well, oftentimes it's overdone. And so, I've got to clean these up. First, I'm going to run them through the sand blaster. Then I got to straighten these flanges out. Then we can start to bake the hub cores. Now it looks like the core that I need is going to be roughly 4 inch in diameter and about 7 inches long. So I've got a piece of white ash here I'm going to use. Oftentimes these old hubs were made out of rock elm or called red elm. But I don't have any of that here so I do use ash on occasion. So that's what I'm going to use for these. Now the lathe I'm going to use today is a lathe that I often use for light wood turning and it is actually a metal lathe. The model number on it is 3015 with an LA stamped by it. Not really sure what the date is, maybe some of you can let me know that. It is a South Bend lathe and one thing that is kind of unique about it, it's a treadle lathe. The treadle attachment is missing and I have plans here someday to rebuild that, replace it. So somebody's modified it to run an electric motor on it. But this is what I use for my wood turning when it comes to light sarvin hubs. And I know there's really quite a collector circle that likes these old pedal lathes. This is actually a double pedal lathe. But the unique thing about this lathe is the bed on it is actually 54 inch where most of them I've seen are only 48. So this is a pretty handy lathe.
I think I got her pretty close. Little flat I got to take out. Maybe one more pass and I'll have her down to round. Well, the first step in fitting this core to the flanges is I'm going to take the largest diameter of the flanges, right where they would be up against the spokes, take that measurement, transfer my ID comparator to my OD comparator, and I'm going to turn this cylinder so it matches the largest diameter of the hub flanges. This process is a little time consuming and I have to be kind of careful. I do it in steps and stages. I go oh, every couple, two, three inches apart and then I can connect the dots, so to speak. One thing about this board turning when you're trying to fit flanges, when it's gone, it's gone. So if you go too far, it's start over again. So this is pretty slow, pretty careful, getting her to fit. So these cores are going to be 7 inches overall and the spokes are going to be for an inch and a quarter. Now I kind of become a creature of habit. I usually work the small end of the hub to my left and the larger to the right. Nothing saying you have to do it that way, it's just my habit. So the small end would be the outside of the hub, larger end is the inside of the hub, or as I work on them, top and bottom. Now the next place we need to take a measurement is the length of this first contact surface. This is three quarters of an inch on the flange, so I'm going to actually make this beveled edge five eighths of an inch long. I purposely make it an eighth of an inch shorter so that when the flanges are pressed on, they don't shoulder out and stop on this first shoulder of the cast flange. So the first thing I do is I use this five eighths mark and I begin to taper away from that, which will become the shoulder on the hub cord. In a Sarvan hub core, there's four places you want contact. 
and they're equivalent to the four bands on a wood common hub for a wagon. These are the two places of contact right up against the spoke and then on each end of the hub core where it comes in contact with the hub flange. In between those four places I'm going to work it away to where there actually is not contact. In the first place of contact is actually between the face of the spokes down to this first shoulder in the flange cast. And this is a taper. So I'm going to take that measurement and then I'll put a taper to the first area that's 5 8 of an inch long. This is equivalent to the hub band or the spoke band that's on a wagon hub. So you can kind of see the amount of difference there is in taper, but since these flanges are cast and not machined, sometimes you have to take the happy medium and take the average. So you'll notice as I put the taper in, in the 5 8 that 5 8 measurement actually lengthens. You can see it here. So once I put the taper in, I'm actually going to have to shoulder that back to back to my 5 8 again. Now I need the distance from the spoke face to the second ridge on the flange. I need that distance so I know where my second place of contact needs to be. So between the first rib and the second rib actually will be worked away to where there is no contact. So now I need the diameter at that second ridge where that point of contact is going to be. From this second ridge to the end of the hub also continues to taper, so I'm going to find that measurement also.
Now using the same procedure, I'm going to use it on the outside flange and go through the same process. So for me, when I have to do more than one hub core, I like to do at least two at a time. Sometimes I'll do all four. This way I don't have to chuck them up multiple times. They're already chucked up. I just part them off and I'll make the next one. So this is one of those jobs you kind of have to pay attention to because they have to fit. The support of the flanges is what really gives strength to the hub core itself. When I have help that are doing this the first time, best advice I have to tell them is when it's gone, it's gone. So it gets to be kind of nerve-wracking for them. But this is how I fit hub cores to a Sarvin flange. Next week, we'll get into maybe building these wheels. Once again, thanks for watching.